I remember that house, the terrace where we shared a room. Us kids, we used to love each other so much. Back before duvets, piles of scratchy blankets topped off with candle wick. Towels on windowsills for condensation, us three in proper pyjamas well buttoned up. Mother downstairs banging pots. My dad kept a helm wheel on the landing. I used to sit cross-legged in my nighty, imagining you could steer a house. Bridlington, I wanted to drive it there. I remember the seafront. A man had a monkey dressed in knitted clothes. On our shoulder in the photograph, it shows us hunched, hair all scissored off, pavilion behind. My dad always dreamed of the sea, would endlessly watch for yachts. So many things that were wrong then. Fagging a match for 20p, taking beans from that bloke's allotment, holding my brothers while they cried. That poor animal, he must have been so afraid. also work in a supermarket um, and obviously it's not the best job in the world but really I wouldn't swap it people often say you should be doing so much more than that but what keeps me there uh, obviously the splendid wage keeps you there um, <laughs> it's the people um, that you get used to uh, we have a lot of regulars um, people will tell you anything um, just because you're sat there and, and, and you can tell the ones that are waiting in line just to tell you something. So I spend a lot of time talking to people. I also spend a lot of time just, just looking at people um, and just observing them. And, and they're such interesting people. I don't care who anybody is or where they come from. Everybody is interesting and everybody is beautiful in their own way. Uh, this one is called The Science of People Watching. I see this lady with Sabino hair, one of them jigsaw dye jobs, half russet, half bleach. She sits, nickering above cappuccino froth, nodding to this fella across, like a Blagden tinker's pony. He has this delayed reaction to her chat. I guess the form of her words is lost in space, time continuum, lip to ear. His tea is a petri dish of apparent fascination. He makes a brown study. Seems a shame she looks as if she's made such an effort. There will always be the energy of kiddies in supermarkets griping for Ket, wild as split atoms spiralling their voices beyond the scale of human recognition, going sonar, becoming a Galton's whistle. There will always be trolley wheels defying, yet proving the first law of motion. We can take comfort in such scientific certainty. A bloke's hands fastened to hip make isosceles triangles of his arms. He carries geometry under his pits. <laughs> <laughs> when I kiss you, you say there isn't going to be a way back for us when we have done this. We are measuring our breath. Your heart is an ohm. It spurns my leaking voltage. A tightrope of saliva between our lips. This is string theory. This is your universe melding with mine. This is parallels. Your hand is a giant cupule above the fit of my breast. No one can tell me that this is not truth. We could be this in another place, in some different turn of time. Thank you. Um, and this one is written from
comments that the people I know there, the customers, have told me. Um, you remember certain people very distinctly and they've all got their favourite till girl and they all come to see them and you get to know all about their lives and, and, and what fabulous characters they are. And, and, and the poem ends with my absolute favourite woman in there and she lives in a respite home along the way there, um, because I live in Bladen. Well, I don't live in Bladen, I work in Bladen. I live in Greenside. I don't know why I said I live in Bladen, because I don't, I feel like I live in Bladen, because I'm always working there. Um, and she escapes. She's not supposed to, um, can I just have my thing to her? She's not supposed to leave unattended, but she does. She escapes and she does a bit of shopping and she gets a taxi back. Thank you very much. No, you're all right. I'll keep you with me. Sorry about this. Uh, and she's brilliant and she looks awful. She's, <laughs> she smells like she has been marinated in regals for 40 years. <laughs> she has no teeth. She has black stubs. She is fantastic. And she's as sharp as a knife. She's superb and she's tiny. She looks like she's been chewed. <laughs> That's the best way I can describe her. <laughs> but anyway, this is called, uh, this is called Sentences to Survive In. I smile because I don't know what else to do but smile, smile. Because he told me I seemed as if I was the happiest lass in the world. How coming here makes his day. How my fella is a lucky man. He smelled of the unkempt dust of loneliness. One pint of milk, one apple, one pear. The lady with the thin hair and tree of life necklace lost her husband. Cancer. She mouths, lost her son three months later, killed himself because of grief. She would have joined them safe for the other children who need her. Lady buying whiskey and rolls for her father's wake. I'm an only child. She has to sort everything out. His house is a mess of papers. Woman in a blue blouse says a friend just passed. He phoned me on Monday, dead by Sunday, ended like Solomon Grundy. His death was a nursery rhyme. <laughs> I see this line of people waiting to share their sadness. The one with long nails has a daughter that fell down the stairs. Excuse me. The dad who had his hip replaced won't use a stick. Middle-aged shoppers with birdie parents yelling at them that it's 24-72, mother. 24-72. The one with the black stubs for teeth that escapes from respite. <laughs> Hates this never going anywhere on my own anymore. She has bought a cream cake. He's getting a taxi back. <laughs> Bugger them. <laughs> Two slices of ham. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Have I got time to read another one? Yeah. Right, this one is written. Um, I went a while ago, it's a series of poems. I went to um, see him, uh, Princess Road Cemetery and see him. I absolutely love, I love lots of places. I go to lots of places um, and just look at stuff. And I was in there walking up and down and I started, obviously you read the gravestones and, 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 and things and I thought, wow, there's some really fantastic names here. I wonder who he was. I wonder who she was. Brilliant, and, and you know, really old graves, and and in my head, I started to build a um, a fantasy village of them. They all lived on the same few streets. They all knew each other. They were all in each other's business, um, a bit like my village is today. Um, so, although I've made it up, the names are real, um, but who knows how close I've come to defining who they were? You, you never know. 
uh, and this poem is called Tongues of Fire. Agnes Seth knew how many mickles made a muckle. Many a little bird told her so. Edith Rowell, all fair court and no niggas. Two wrongs never made no right nor never would. Mary Ann Heckles, those indecent freckles. Hair loose on the hill. Sarah Ann Oxenham, Sarah Ann Oxenham. Your mum is daft and your da drives a van, drives a van, drives a van, a van, a van, Oxenham. Richard Candley, she's always buying her flowers. She takes them and smiles, but her eyes rake the lawn behind his head where Fenwick Hunman stands with his hand on the shoulder of his seated wife. Florence Selina Lowery rolls the stem of a wine glass between kids' soft finger pads, rests her gaze, rests her eyes on the glaze of her blood-red nails, feels nothing. Cigarette smoke corrupts the bloom on a bowl of apricot roses. Isabella, Elsie and Alice Arkenhead argue over whose turn it is to go for the milk. Alice loves to polish the porcelain, but glue lines around little wrists and necks remind her hands of their clumsiness. Matilda Schilling found the way Fanny Willis shelled peas secretly thrilling. Her fingers deft as sticklebacks evading imprisonment in half-filled jam jars. Slick when she sucked them. Humphrey Hopper Green ought to have been a librarian. Books stand in neat as soldiers on shelves. Lovely, <laughs> lovely. The problem with being a librarian was that you had to share them. A space between the tomes, unthinkable. They gather dust. Harriet and Henry Hay. You never saw them apart, not one day. Gently considering aphids, hoeing between rows of <coughs> onions, he puts a palm in the small of her dented back. She smiles and squints at the sun. They say hello to strangers. He could never be closer to anyone as he could be to your twin. No need to explain anything. Big brown leather bound Bible all bugger down the docks and laugh behind your back. Stories of ships you never sailed on. Spare the rod and spoil the child. Meb and Hunter Murley, your children hate you. <laughs> Mary Dove, even your name was enough to inspire feelings of love. You were so beautiful. Men would press their ears to your chest and hear the sea. There was always a petrol circling above your house, so the tale went. If it flew anti-clockwise, there would be a storm. <laughs> Mary's children were fairies. They all went to the tide. It's them who put the blue stones on the beach at Moses Point. Folks say they are magic. Archibald Thompson, stiff under green grave glass. The dawn light gives it the feel of waking waves. There is nothing more to say about a man nobody knew. Janet Minto Job went down the pub, met James Jabez. After four sherry, she sang to the piano, sat on his knee with a slip on shore. On their wedding day, she carried a bouquet of carnations in front of their baby. Maybe it was the call of the sirens made him jilt her. Two years later, him brought back dead. The sea, you could hear her scream ten streets ahead. Elizabeth Boyle in her beautiful bonnet, collecting cash for the Sally Bash, crisp black bow, deep red sash. Trembling her tambourine, imagining tones of fire. 
Frederick Esmond Allen smartly pressed. She feels his breath down the back of her vest as he sounds his baritone. Elizabeth Boyle shakes her tin, drinks weak tea, needs a gin. <laughs> <laughs>